And then if there's some evidence which contradicts our worldview, we will either not read it to begin with, or read it with the mindset of trying to pick it apart. And so I looked at that study on my iPad, and it seemed to say completely the opposite. The higher the pay gap, the better the company performs. So, so right now, there are um, proposals from the Financial Conduct Authority to mandate diversity targets for the employees that you have within your, an organisation. And that's something I, as an ethnic minority, should be delighted with. But actually, if you look at the evidence backing for it, it is pretty weak. Welcome to the Institute of Economic Affairs. My name's Tom Plockerty. I'm the Executive Director here. And for the next, well, 30 minutes, perhaps I'm going to be talking to our star guest this evening, Alex Edmonds. Uh, Alex is a Professor of Finance at the London Business School. He's the Managing Editor of the Review of Finance. Uh, he's somewhat famous for his TED Talk, What to Trust in a Post-Truth World. Um, he's the author of a couple of books. One uh, he discussed here, or well, online, but through the IA with my predecessor during the pandemic. That was Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Purpose and Profit. Uh, but tonight we're talking about his latest book, which is, as you've probably noticed, available at the back of the room, May Contain Lies, How Stories, Statistics and Studies Exploit Our Biases and What We Can Do About It. Uh, one quick note for the audience before we start, this event is obviously being filmed. And if you need any assistance, you can head back out into the lobby and one of my colleagues will be able to direct you. Uh, with that out of the way, Alex, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so thank much for the invitation. It's, it's really great to be here. Um, it's a really, really interesting book, I've got to say. Um, and when I first saw the title and thought we were going to be discussing it, I thought, well, this, this might be a bit of a slog. But actually, um, it's a very easy read. Um, and I think, you, you know, you illustrate your points throughout with fascinating stories that really just draw the reader in. Um, and so, I mean, congratulations on that. I mean, I think you've taken uh, what's potentially quite a difficult topic and really brought it to life. Um, and so I hope we can dig into that a bit over the next um, few minutes. But the first part of your book, and really your starting point, um, is that we have certain cognitive biases, um, which make us inclined to lead to conclusions or to misunderstand the world around us. So you talk about confirmation bias, you talk about black and white thinking as the two sort of core things that are likely to lead us astray. I wonder if you can just sort of explain those problems for us in very basic terms. Yeah, certainly. So confirmation bias is the idea that we have a worldview. And if we see research which accords with that worldview, we will lap it up uncritically. So we won't scrutinise the methodology, we'll believe the conclusion, we'll tweet it or exit from the rooftops and share it without even reading whether the methodology was, was correct. And then if there's some evidence which contradicts our worldview, we will either not read it to begin with or read it with the mindset of trying to pick it apart. And so that applies to many things about which there are strong existing views. This could be gun control, abortion, capitalism, immigration, and so on. But you might think, well, aren't there many topics where we are pretty neutral? We don't have a pre-existing view. And that's where the second bias comes in, which is black and white thinking. That's the idea that I don't know whether something is good or bad, but I know it can either be one or the other, so I view the world in binary terms. And so one example I talk about in the book is carbohydrates. So when you think about food, protein, most people think protein is good. It repairs your muscles, it grows them. Most people think fat is bad, if they called it because it makes you fat. But carbs are, are pretty not so clear cut. And so the Atkins diet was really successful because this played on black and white thinking. It said, let's demonize carbs and say they are really bad. Let's not say keep carbs 20 to 40% of your daily calories. Let's aim for zero carbs or as few as possible. And notice that had Atkins had the opposite result, had he claimed let's have a diet where we eat as many carbs as possible, that might also have gone viral because it plays into black and white thinking and it's also really easy to implement. You don't need to look at whether carbs are complex or simple or sugars or starch. Just eat as many carbs as possible or eat as few. And that's where an idea can go viral if it plays on those biases. Mm. And I think in, in the book you do mention, at least for black and white thinking, that this has a kind of evolutionary basis. Mm. Um, but there's a broader point that kind of occurs to me there that these biases, um, yes, they may lead us astray, but are they also useful shortcuts? Um, they're ways of dealing with complexity. And so I wonder if sort of springing on from that, yeah. is the role that these biases play in public debate and everything else, um, as we move into an increasingly information-rich world, 
are they getting more prominent? Are they getting more dangerous? Mm -hmm. um, but are they nonetheless useful in some way? Yeah, so I think biases, just like anything, will be useful up to a point, particularly if we recognise its limitations. So, so right now, like, there's so many different news sources that we, we, we want we could read. And if my view of the world is capitalism is a good thing, wh which I believe, I might think, well, anybody who agrees with my view, that is a good source of information. So I might be more willing to read, say, The Telegraph than The, the Guardian. And is that bias or is that the fact that uh, I, I believe, based on my study of economics, that actually free market policies tend to be good, that's why I gravitate more towards them. But if it was the only thing that I read and I was blinded to counter arguments, then I think my knowledge of the world would, would be would be poorer. Mm. So I'm not saying that we need to read all different sources evenly, but it might be that we want to have a halfway house. Maybe I might predominantly read The Telegraph or The Economist, but also see what some of the critiques are. And that's also the case for, for black and white thinking. So you mentioned it has an evolutionary um, beginning, which it does. So when you had to make decisions at scale, when there are fight or flight responses, you need to have simple rules. So maybe if you're a hunter-gatherer, this might be run from carnivores. And they, that might be somebody with uh, an animal with eyes in the front of the head and sharp teeth. Sometimes that could lead to incorrect decisions because you could run from a dog and you could have used that dog to help with the hunt or domesticate it. Nowadays, we don't have speed so much of the essence. Situations are not life and death, but we could make decisions at scale. So let's say you're the manager of a mutual fund. You could choose thousands and thousands of stocks. Some of them might have black and white rule, rules like avoid all fossil fuel stocks. This is just something where there's climate risk and I'm worried about that. In reality, some fossil fuel stocks are good investment opportunities. They might have been overly discounted. They might be moving towards renewable energy. But that black and white rule helps them make decisions, even though sometimes it can lead to the, the wrong conclusion. Mm. So I'm conscious that my next question is somewhat akin to, can you tell us what your book says? Um, but basically, you, you structure the bulk of the book, part two, around this ladder of misinference, mm. um, which goes from sort of statement to fact to data to evidence to proof. Um, and I, I think it would be really helpful, actually, if you could talk us through that in, obviously not in the, the hundreds of pages of detail you do in the book, but that basic way of framing the argument and thinking through the problem. Um, it, yeah, absolutely. So the book is about misinformation and how to combat it. And I have to acknowledge there's lots of other great books on misinformation out there, which I've learned from. But sometimes those books can be hard to remember and put into practice because they tend to be laundry lists of all the different ways in which we can be misinformed. And if I need to be got on my guard against 50 different things, then I might not put it into practice. So I wanted to structure the different types of misinformation into four steps. And those are four steps on what I call the ladder of misinference, which is how we can misinterpret data. So the first step is the difference between statements and fact. So I say a statement is not fact because it may not be accurate. And so what's an example of that? So let's say a very famous phrase is the idea that Jack Welch, the former CEO of GE, said shareholder capitalism is the dumbest idea of the, in the world. And this was catnip to anti-capitalists because they said, look, this this guy who's one of the big leading lights of capitalism now is turning his back on it. Now, notice that was absolutely accurate. He did say that. But one of the punchlines of the book is even if something is 100% accurate, it can be misleading. And what was misleading here is that they chopped off the start and the end of the statement. He said, on the face of it, shareholder capitalism is the dumbest idea in the world. It is a result, not a strategy. And so that's got a quite different meaning, actually, to measure a company by how much shareholder value it's created. That is a good thing. That is the result. But is the strategy I'm going to try to create shareholder value? No, it might be I'm going to grow my sales. It might be I'm going to expand geographically. And so that's all he meant. So it's quite different. So number one is just check the statement, check the actual content. The second misstep is a fact is not data because it may not be representative. So let's give another example. So Simon Sinek's got this book, Start With Why, and a TED Talk viewed way more millions of times than my own. And so he claims Apple was successful because it started with why. So Apple's been extremely successful. The first company to will be worth a trillion. And let's say Apple did start with why. How do we know that starting with why leads to success? That is one hand-picked example. 
there could be millions of other examples of companies that started with why and failed, and yet we never see these examples because Simon Sinek will never give anything which contradicts its viewpoint. So again, one thing is completely true, misleading because it's not representative. Step three is the difference between data and evidence. So you might think, well, is it the solution to gather hundreds of hundreds of data points? But step three highlights that data is not evidence because it may not be conclusive. So let me explain that. First, what is data and what is evidence? Data is a collection of lots of facts. So let's say sustainable companies tend to be more profitable. That is true in large-scale data looking at hundreds of companies. But what is evidence? Well, where do we hear the word evidence a lot? Criminal trials. And in a criminal trial, evidence is evidence that convicts one suspect but is inconsistent with other suspects. If the evidence is consistent with lots of suspects, it is not evidence. And so this is the difference between correlation and, and causation. So if sustainable companies perform better, one suspect is sustainability leads to better performance, but an alternative suspect is performance allows the company to be more sustainable. A third suspect is maybe the industry both leads to sustainability and performance. And yet we all know that correlation is not causation, but if confirmation bias is strong, we just latch onto the one suspect that we, we um, care about. And the final one is evidence is not proof. So evidence might allow you to convict that suspect in that murder trial, it was the husband who killed the wife. Does that mean all the time women are murdered, that is the husband? No, that was one particular case. A proof is universal. When Archimedes said the area of a square is pi times the radius squared, the theory of circles, sorry, that was proven for all circles around the world but evidence is only context-specific. One final example is Malcolm Gladwell says that you could be an expert in anything, chess, neurosurgery, ballet dancing, if you spend 10,000 hours. The evidence he looked at was just violin. Now, violin is a really different context from neurosurgery. One of them is really predictable, you play music. The other of them, you're just responding to lots of real-life situations. And so what you see in one context, even if it's 100% accurate, might not apply in others. And in fact, it wasn't even true for the violin, right, when you dug into the 10,000 hours story. Interestingly, he misses every single step of the ladder. So, so, so the first is that that statement is not fact, is that there was no mention of 10,000 hours in the original study. It was only a study based on 10 successful violinists and also, is it correlational or causation? So what he asked the violinist was, how many hours did you practice 15 years ago? So you might think practicing 15 years ago leads you to being successful right now. Or if you're a great violinist right now, you will think, well, I must have practiced really hard to get this far. If you weren't a good violinist, your cognitive dissonance will mean that you won't admit that you practiced a lot because that would admit that your time was wasted. Just like we had the London Marathon on, on, on Sunday. And if somebody didn't hit their time, they will say, oh, I just didn't really train for it. And if they did hit it, they'll say, yeah, I trained really hard. That's why I hit my time was because I put the effort in and I made sacrifices. And so that's, that's why he, he missed that ladder step as well. Um, so I, funny enough, I was going to ask you... Um, the book, as I said, is full of great stories that illustrate your points, or at least illustrates the failings that you're trying to highlight. Um, and you've mentioned a few of those stories already, but is there a particular favourite story you have in the book, maybe something you unearthed while doing the research? Um, that and it doesn't have to illustrate the whole thesis, of course, but is there one thing that just really blew your mind when you came across it and you put in the book? Yeah, I think it's, I'll, I'll probably go with the opening story, which is right yeah. in the introduction. So I, I'm a professor of finance as my day job, um, and I uh, wrote some evidence for the Select Committee hearing on corporate governance, which the UK government um, commissioned a few years ago. And I was invited to testify in this inquiry. Uh, I was nervous, so I, I got in early so that I can swat up on any question that they might ask. So I sat in the session before me. And then the witness said some research which sounded noteworthy. They claimed the lower the gap between CEO pay and average worker pay, the better the company performance. And so some of my work is on responsible, sustainable business. So I thought, okay, that, that accords with some of my research. So I thought, well, let me not take it for face value. Let me try and look it up. And so I looked up the witness's statement. They referenced a study. And so I looked at that study on my iPad. And it seemed to say completely the opposite. The higher the pay gap, the better the company performance. 
I thought, yeah, I know I'm nervous, but I can't be so nervous that I'm misreading the study. So yeah, it was there, clear as day. So I realised what had happened is the witness quoted a half-finished study. The witness was the trade union's congress. So they have a strong public position against pay gaps. They found the half-finished version of the study, which found that high pay gaps are bad. They quoted it, even though the published version, which had overturned its mistakes, found the opposite, high pay gaps are good. So I was really surprised they did this. And so I, I told the clerk to the select committee afterwards, he said, this is really bad. You should submit some supplementary evidence. I did. They published it. But at the end of the inquiry, the final report of the UK Select Committee of the House of Commons referred to the original study. So why would you ask what, why, what really struck me? Two things struck mm. me about that. Number one... Even something that we think is reliable, a House of Commons report, might not be. It's written by humans, and humans have their biases. And number two, it's the fact that we can always find research to show whatever we want to support. Right? Even a half-finished study, when a finished version is available, if you've got a strong position against pay gaps, find the study that's, that shows you this. We bandy around this phrase, studies find, research shows, evidence proves that, this is meaningless because you're going to almost always find a study to give you the result that you want. Yeah. I, the other thing in that introduction anecdote that uh, struck me was that um, you, you, were, you were quite shocked when they asked you, the MPs asked you a question and you just said, yeah, I don't know. And then, mm. They couldn't believe that someone would just admit, no, I don't know that. And let's move on to the next thing. But that is actually one of the problems in, in the public policy debate, um, that there is such a sort of strong... Uh, emphasis on pretending you know everything and being able to respond immediately um that it really i think this is one of the reasons why debate is often so poor um but anyway I, the big implication of your book um is that we need to get a lot better at critical thinking um but i suppose i can see people responding to this in in different ways perhaps from the one that you intend and and, and one is negative one is maybe positive um so the negative version i can see people reading your book and thinking, well, nothing is reliable. It would take an enormous amount of work to decide whether I can trust anything. So either they'll become extremely cynical or very subjective about everything, or they might just become kind of nihilistic mm. and say, you know, nothing is meaningful, so whatever. I suppose the alternative, which I like, but maybe I'm displaying my own cognitive biases when I say this, um, is that people could read your book and say, you know, what we need is a lot more modesty about our own understanding of things yeah. and what we can prove. Um, and then maybe that should encourage people to be a lot more reticent about intervening or about thinking they can design improvements to, to what ex already exists. So you can sort of make a Hayekian pretense of knowledge case here as well. Um, but I mean, how, how do you respond to that? Um, do you think that either of those responses are likely? Um, or do you think it's realistic, actually, that we can all just become much better at critical thinking, given the enormous amount of complex information that surrounds us? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, because people might think, OK, if I look at the title of the book, it's about statistics and studies. I don't have a PhD in statistics. Is it realistic to get me to scrutinise every paper and ask, is correlation the same as causation? So this is why I really appreciate your comments on the writing of the book, Tom. I don't have a single equation in there. I try to make it readable and accessible for a general audience. And this highlights that often the solution to these things is just common sense. But we don't need statistical firepower, but common sense and discernment. And that already most people have within themselves. So if I post a study on LinkedIn, which people don't like the sound of, there's no shortage of counter-arguments as to why it might be flimsy, why it might be hand-picked data or one example or not generalizable. But then suddenly their critical thinking faculties are switched off when they find something that they do like. And so all I'm trying to encourage you is to harness the discernment that you already have within yourself and you're ready to deploy selectively and let's now try to deploy this more consistently. So one simple tip I have in the book is if there's a study which gives you the findings that you like, imagine it gave you the opposite results and think how you would try to knock it down. So let's have an example. So I'm looking forward to hopefully having some red wine after this. I, I thought not before, but afterwards. And, and let's say I want to drink loads of red wine afterwards. I could look up and find a study showing that people who drink more red wine 
live longer. Great. That is my excuse. But before I reach for the Bordeaux or for the Claret, let me just turn this the other way around. Let's assume I found a study, find that drinking more red wine leads to a shorter life. How do I knock that out? I might say, well, maybe the people who drink red wine are poorer people. They can't afford champagne or top-level spirits. And that's that poverty, which means they can't afford health insurance or other things. And that poverty is what leads to the shorter life. But now that I've alerted myself to the possibility of this alternative suspect, which is income, does that explain the result, even though it's the direction that I do like? Maybe red wine is correlated with longer life because people who can afford red wine are wealthier than people who are affording beer or alcopops. And so this idea of imagining the opposite and seeing how you would knock it down, that will hopefully harness the critical thinking you already have. I think we may just have a small microphone problem. This one here? Absolutely. Sure. Yep. <laughs> no, good. Well, I hope you've all heard everything so far. That's probably just for the recording purposes, I think. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about, as we'll get to part three of the book, yeah. um, about the precise things you know you recommend uh, we can do. But I want to talk a little bit, because we're at the IA, about how you can apply um, the lessons of this book to, to public policy mm -hmm. um, and to economics. Um, and so I guess... It, it, Here's a question I'll lead with. Um, how can we assess public policies, whether they're good or bad, ineffective or ineffective? Um, because, you know, in the book you say, and I'm sure rightly, that randomised controlled trials are the best way to assess the effectiveness of things, often not possible mm. for policies. Um, natural experiments are an alternative, but they may not always be available. Um, often actually good data about government policies is just non-existent. Um, so what can, we, what can we do about this? How can we apply the kind of lessons that you draw out in this book mm. to making better policies? I think it's to be driven by evidence and to be based on evidence, even though we recognise that evidence is not the be-all and end-all. So yes, we don't always have randomised control trials, but perfect should not be the enemy of good. Let's look at the evidence that we do have and let's not dogmatically be based on this because it might only get part of the way, but let's try to use it wherever possible. So, so let's give an example. So, so right now there are um, proposals from the Financial Conduct Authority to mandate diversity targets for the employees that you have within your, an organisation. And that's something I, as an ethnic minority, should be delighted with. But actually, if you look at the evidence backing for it, it is pretty weak. So what they will cite are certain papers which claim a link between demographic diversity and firm performance, but these papers are not written by scientists, they're written by the likes of McKinsey, and so this is more advocacy rather than research. Obviously, McKinsey has an incentive to publish papers showing diversity pays off. That's really good for its image. Mm. It would never publish a paper with the opposite. It would be cancelled for, for, for doing that. And so what is surprising is there's a lot of great academic research out there which highlights that the link between diversity and performance is much more nuanced. Does this invalidate diversity initiatives? Absolutely not, but it highlights that diversity is far more than gender and ethnicity. If we focus only on that, that gives the impression that a white male can never add diversity to an organisation, even if he is the first in his family ever to go to university, even if he's from uh, the north of England, there's a lot of regional inequality here, even if his background is, economic, is, is, is humanities and everybody else is in economics and finance. So what that suggests is that, well, when we want to try to measure or have a policy on diversity, we might want to look more broadly than just these two things, gender and ethnicity. But because those are things which are simple and they go with the zeitgeist, that's what people typically focus on. Mm -hmm. So that's a case in which, in response to this, I wrote some um, relatively strongly worded, although still constructive, response for why I thought what the FCA was, a was doing was barking up the long tree. No. Here's a question that possibly I should ask you in private, but I'll ask it now anyway, and I hope I don't regret it. But, um, through the framing of this book, how do you think that the free market movement or the classical liberal movement is doing in terms of making its arguments? Are there particular areas where you think we're falling down? Do you think there are particular kind of avenues of research um, that people like the IA are just missing out on? I think 
for me, you're preaching to the converter because I'm very much aligned with 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 the um, the viewpoints of of, of the IEA. Um, so for me to see the flaws in it, it it's it's tricky because I, I see the logic behind it. Right. So it might be other people who are, are less aligned to it might might um, might might be better at pitching in. But maybe that that is my answer. Then is actually mm. to try to to, to, to test to, to to road test sort of the arguments that are used. And see whether they fall on on deaf ears. So if it is that high CEO pay is actually good for financial performance of a company, maybe people are saying, well, maybe there's gold other than financial performance, and maybe you, you're, you're not considering considering that. So mm. it might be that people have different objectives. So sometimes when you say a policy works or does not work, you might be talking at cross purposes because people have different objectives to begin with. So it's one thing to have disagreement on the same objective, and that's where better evidence can help you. But if we have different goals to begin with, uh, then maybe that's when some of the policies, the ideas might might not actually cut cut through for them. Mm. Mm. And so another slightly think tank centering question here. But, uh, I, you know, I, I one of the good things about the book, I think is, for me at least, it made me reflect a little bit on the challenges we face in our own work. Um, and... I, you know, I think there's there's a trade off around communications, mm. and obviously, as a as an author um, and, and as a public speaker and so on, you must sometimes sense this as well mm. that um, if you make something very balanced, very factual, um, if you kind of sort of strip the narrative out of it, if you try not to just appeal to people's cognitive biases, you may not get an awful lot of attention, mm. uh, and so that really sort of diminishes the power of the good idea. On the other hand, there's always the danger that the the narrative um, and the selling kind of takes over. I'm sure at some point, if it hasn't happened already, our comms team will get sick of me telling them, "Can we make this a little bit more boring, please?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, it, we 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 work in an environment where um, sort of the loud press release mm-hmm. um, or the snazzy headline or the the killer figure takes you an awfully long way, um, and we try hard not to be misled by that. Yeah. Um, but how do you, as, as a as a finance professor, as an academic, as someone who sort of prizes the independence of research, how do you make sure um, that you make everything as robust as you can? Yeah. So when you do academic research, so what you typically do was, um, but, but, but you'll you'll make it public by putting it on a publicly available website, not behind any paywall. But then you take it on the road. So you take it to conferences and seminars and present it to people. And you invite people to criticise you as much as possible mm. so that you can see other, other viewpoints. And that is what's done way before sending to a journal to try to get it peer-reviewed and accepted. But if you contrast that with a lot of research put out by consultancies, there there is no vetting process and they're not seeing a, a, a potential other side. And so I think this is this is really important. And then more generally, what I'll try to do, not just with my research, but others' research, is if there is research which is circulating and having an impact and is misleading, I will try to constructively and professionally, but still call it out. And so that was one of the reasons for writing the book is, mm. I think, if, if my job as a professor is to produce research, but the way in which this research has impact only is dependent on whether people like its findings. What are we doing as an academic profession? We're not really cutting through. So I wanted to write about the importance of biases so that research would have uh, more of um, an attention based on its rigour, not its findings. And so this is something I see Chris Snowden doing a good job of. So he will take some quite simple statements with appealing headlines, sometimes that I might want to believe myself, and he highlights that actually, if you just look a little bit beyond the hood, then it's really flimsy. Mm. And Chris does make a, a fleeting appearance in your book, I think, um, when you're talking about the spirit level and then his response to it, the spirit level delusion. So nice to nice to have an IEA cameo mm. in there. Although it was before he joined us, of course. But um, one of the one of the things in your book when you move into the solutions phase um, is, in a sense, a defence of academic research, of the peer review process, um, of publishing in journals, and I mean, we we have we we arrange peer review of the the studies and the books that we pro, uh, that we publish. We co-publish an academic journal, so I don't want to obviously sit here and trash the idea of peer review, uh, but I do wonder whether it's everything it's cranked up to be. Um, and I, you know, I have read interesting things saying, you know, look, peer review as, as it's practiced today is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be the gold standard for all, t- all time. And maybe actually the way things are working now where stuff is immediately published online and is just open 
to a sort of free-for-all criticism and refinement and review is better in two respects. One, that you kind of break out of the, the biases of the editors and the, the peer review panels. Um, you get more voices to bear on it. Uh, but the other thing is it, it, it comes out so much faster. So the knowledge transmission is quicker um, and it's available to everyone. Whereas, you know, the final versions of peer reviewed articles, um, most of us don't really have access to, or at least only have access to the abstract, mm. uh, which may not tell you everything you need to know. Um, I mean, obviously you take a different view, uh, but I'm curious, how strong is your defense of the kind of current mode of academic publishing? Um, and do you think there are, there's room for improvement there? Yeah, so I, a bit of both. So I, I certainly think it's valuable, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So so peer review it is good. It's not perfect, but perfect should not be the enemy of good. So how does peer review work at the moment? When you submit a, a, a manuscript to a journal, and I was an editor for six years, I would send it to the world's leading minds to scrutinise it for its accuracy. And sometimes it may well be that the study has a 180 degree turn in its conclusions after correcting its mistakes, like that pay gap study. So it's not just a rubber stamp, it is a serious process. But it's not perfect. Like sometimes bad papers will get through the peer review process. And so the controversy we have right now with Francesca Gino at Harvard with her research on dishonesty, actually saw that research was dishonest. She was faking the data and papers get, get retracted. But I still think it, it adds something is that even though it's not a 100% seal of approval, it's a bit like a kite mark, just like we can sleep a little bit more safely at night if our locks bear the British Standards Institute kite mark for, for lock security. Are there better potential methods? Probably, almost certainly, that th there will be. Um, but they will still be within the context of the idea of reviewing. So right now, the problem with peer review is maybe I only select two people who review it. And those two people might have blind spots. Or maybe as an editor, I have a blind spot. And I really want to get the paper published because in accordance with my findings, I choose two people who are likely to be positive. So there could be other models where even after a paper is peer reviewed and accepted by a journal, it goes on the journal's website. And then people can comment on, on that by saying, well, hey, here's a concern that we have. Now, you might have uh, an idea, a, a problem that who is it who commentates on this? Mm. So are there sort of gatekeepers that you have to be with, within the scientific community or you get upvoted or downvoted based on the quality? Just like we do have reviews of products and, and they're not perfect, but I still pay some attention to customer reviews of products. So is that something where we could have as well as the hidden archaic process of, of, of peer review where we don't even know who the reviewers are. Mm -hmm. So the one, other, one other thing I want to mention is this similar theme, actually, and there's something quite counterintuitive fairly early on in the book um, where you mentioned, effectively, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the more knowledgeable people are, often the more biased they get. Yeah. Um, I suppose because they, they see more things to confirm their biases. <laughs> um, and then they become more black and white in their thinking. But... Do you see that problem creeping into academic research as well? Or is the whole point of being an academic level researcher that you can get a step beyond that kind of knowledge problem? So I certainly see the, the problem in general. So the idea is that if you're more knowledgeable, then you can poke holes in arguments that you don't like. And so this makes the problem of confirmation bias worse. Even if something is, is truly valid, you will just find some way, some clever argument to, to, to find a flaw in that. I think that, that this could be the, the case in, in academia. So there are certain people with strong views and they will reject any paper which contradicts it, even if it's perfect because of their ability to, to find some holes. So as an editor, I sort of know who, who these people are, particularly in, in my field, and I'll try to avoid them. But there is the possibility that some editors are biased. And maybe I, I might have been biased in certain decisions and then you deliberately go to somebody yeah. who is going to be using motivated reasoning. So this is why I think just to um, have a paper success or failure boil down only to who the editor happens to choose is a bit too binary, a bit too black and white, maybe mm. to use one of our earlier phrases. And so this more general crowdsourcing approach may well be better. Do you think that artificial intelligence can play a role in, in helping us deal with the problems you identify in the book. Uh, now, so on the one hand, if you had some sort of truly neutral and almost all-knowing artificial intelligence and you could ask it, you know, can you summarize the research for me on topic X, Y, or Z? Um, that would be a great tool. 
But on the other hand, I mean, I've already seen research suggesting that most of the large language models have a very clear uh, left of center bias. Mm -hmm. um, and that's largely they're replicating the biases of the people who've tested them yeah. um, before they're made available to the public. But I mean, do you, do you see artificial intelligence as helpful to the things you're talking about in this book or potentially there's big downsides there too? <laughs> I think with any new, new tool that there's there's both potential and there's also potential for misuse if you don't understand its, its limitations. So on the one hand, well, what is powerful about it is it can go there and do the research and not be not be swayed by one particular study. So there is a study in the Lancet that vaccination causes autism, but the scientific consensus is that's not the case. And so what um, AI could do is look across all of those studies and find what the consensus is. But the concern is, is sometimes, well, they might put weight on the number of studies, not the quality of studies. So if indeed there's loads of papers out there claiming that demographic diversity leads to better performance, and if those studies are really well circulated across the internet, then depending on how they do their search, they might find all of those studies and they might put more weight on them than more um, scientifically accurate ones. So I think what would what would what, what, what would this mean for the use of those models is those models will capture the consensus by quantity but not necessarily by quality. That could still be useful, but I wouldn't rely exclusively on that. I think there will still be room for human judgment even in a in a post AI world. All right. Possibly last question for me, although I'll keep one or two up my sleeve just in case. Um, if I asked you to boil down your recommendations mm. into three, mm. one for individuals one for organizations or companies and one for society as a whole for how they can understand the world better um, and avoid making the mistakes you highlight in the book what would those three recommendations be for individuals it would be question everything so show discernment not just to stuff that we don't like but show discernment even if there's a, a finding that we do like Number two for organizations, it would be encourage dissent. So in organizations, and I was at Morgan Stanley at the start of my career, you have this senior boss and you never challenge them, you just do what they say. But why you have problems like Silicon Valley Bank and the financial crisis is people were unwilling to challenge. There was Alfred Sloan when he ran GM. He ended the meeting by saying, uh, does anybody disagree with this idea? Nobody did. He said, well, let's postpone the decision until the next meeting so that you had a chance to disagree. Mm. So he thought, yes, I'm the leader, but not everything I say will be perfect. And if nobody disagrees, it's not because I'm right. It's because I've not given real time. And the third for societies is to teach critical thinking in, in, in schools. So we teach about like literacy and we teach now IT literacy. What about statistical literacy? And that's something which, again, doesn't require a PhD or even an A-level in statistics. <laughs> The idea that correlation is not causation is the idea that there's multiple suspects. So kids learn really early on when they read a murder mystery, there's multiple suspects. Often the obvious person didn't commit the crime. And so they learn to think outside the box. And if that's something that you can instill at a young age, either through these um, problems, I also give a couple of brain teasers, which could be taught at schools in, in the book. That's something which I think will be really, really useful to get people to have this idea of being discerning, recognising there's multiple ways to interpret the same data. Yeah. Alex, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to hear that internal dissent is key to successful organisations. It means we're going to do fantastically well at the IEA, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, as I said, I, it's a really compelling book, um, and I hope there are, there are some questions from the audience. So let's turn to you now. Uh, all right, let, let's go to the front first. Yes, just microphone coming. I appreciate the title, May Contain Lies. Where's the space for ethics in that title? And secondly, in what ways can we bridge the gap between academia and the industry? I have read your LinkedIn post about the FCA. I endorse it. I'm a big advocate for intersectionality rather than one or two. But as you said very correctly, sometimes the objectives differ. And I very much strongly believe that McKinsey or somebody like McKinsey might as well get started on somewhere rather than not start at all. 
And to me, that's a very obvious kind of distinction between the objectives that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So much as I do wholeheartedly appreciate the academic sort of perspective, I'm an academic myself, mm -hmm. having worked 25 years in the financial industry, I do appreciate the nuances of the language mm -hmm. and ethics as well as objectives. So anything you'd like to address in what I just said, I'd very much appreciate. Thanks. Great questions. Thanks so much for, for raising them. So I think well, where does where does ethics come into play? And I think often in, in the misrepresentation of data, that is sometimes unethical. So it, even if what you say is completely true, Apple was successful and Apple started with Y, to suggest that starting Y is a universal secret to success, that is, I don't think, ethical. And so what I'm trying to highlight here is how even if something is within the letter of the law, because it's it's still factual, you might be unethical in terms of the interpretations that you draw from it. Then in terms of the bridge of academia and, and practice, I, I love this question and I, I could speak probably for half an hour on it, but I, I'll limit myself because there's lots of other questions, which is great. I sincerely and passionately believe there needs to be much more interaction. So as academics, what is really sad is that you're promoted and given tenure almost exclusively on your academic research. So teaching plays almost zero rule role even though teachers are, are your students, are, are your clients. Like, would my promotion at Morgan Stanley be independent of how my clients thought about me? That, that would be crazy. But unfortunately, people view teaching as just a solid activity. You should be really committed to academic research. And people don't really care about the practical impact of research. If you to write a book or write an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, that is sometimes given not zero weight, but negative weight. So people think your research must be so dumbed down that it's accessible to the unwashed masses, which I think is a really patronising way to look at things. Why do we do research? Why do alumni donate money? It's because that research should have practical implications. And so if I was king for the day or dean for the day, I would try to change the evaluation processes to highlight the importance. And so I'm not king and I'm not dean. But a few years ago, I was invited to give a keynote speech at one of the major finance conferences. And rather than presenting a paper, um, my own research, I gave this talk called The Purpose of a Finance Professor. Say, well, why are we here? It's actually to create and disseminate knowledge, not just to be very internally facing. And one of the things that I was highlighting was the importance of, of, um, of teaching and, and public impact. Now, I can't say, oh, this has definitely led to this school doing this, but I know that that has been a widely circulated article, so people at least have it in mind when they're thinking of what to evaluate when deciding to promote somebody. Uh, Alison, did you have a question? Yes, I need this space. Um, thank, you very, thank you very much. Um, Alex, I loved your previous book, and uh, I love some of your quotes, particularly the one about what is a fact. Um, which needs to be uh, true in all time, on all occasions, and probably in every weather. And I also love the one about fairness, uh, which uh, fairness and equality. So uh, giving every giving everybody the same exam grade is equal, but it's not fair. And I think anybody that's been through an exam can um, associate themselves with that. I wanted to ask you uh, your view on the recent CAST report, not not perhaps the content of it, but how it's been received by people. Um, so uh, CAS, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, the review on the treatment of children in uh, in Gids, the gender identity uh, service um, based at the Tavistock Clinic. And um, Dr. Cass found that there was no... Uh, the research hadn't been done. There was no clinical evidence for uh, the treatments that were being prescribed. And um, she got a lot of pushback. And looking now at the the um, what's happening with the reviews of it from outside, there is definitely a pushback from people and their confirmation bias to say that there are, you know, gender is not black and white. And some say gender is black and white. Um, uh, so I'd just like to know if you've got an opinion on that and how it has been received. Thank you for, for your kind words and my prior work. And thank you for, for this question. So this is something why I haven't read the report in detail, just because I, I've been tied up in the run up to, to the book launch. But I have seen some of, the med some of the media coverage of it. And the concern that you're portraying 
is one which I think is a very real one, that you can be cancelled if you are presenting a particular viewpoint, that people's confirmation bias is so strong that if you present a particular result, they think you might be biased or have some ideology about it. The confirmation bias um, is so strong that people react to something they don't like, a bit like they are given a tiger attack. So there's actually some neurological studies that it triggers your amygdala to see a report like that and the amygdala is the same part of the brain that that leads to a fight or flight response so while i don't know the ins and outs of that study in the field of diversity where i do work um the fact that i'm an ethnic minority does allow me to express some concerns about the mckinsey diversity studies that i would not be able to express if i were a white man and i think this is crazy because the quality of what I say, so whether people should believe what I say depends on just the arguments that I make, not the colour of my skin. But because the biases are so strong there, that gives me the licence to say things that other people might not be able to say for being cancelled. And I see the, the, the concerns with the, the, the debate on gender I- identity is even more politically charged than the one on diversity. If you say something on social media, if you say all Asians are nerdy on social media, you won't get cancelled. You might be seen as a bit rude, but if you were to say you are not allowed to change your sex or, or, or women are women, then you will be absolutely cancelled. So even though I've seen in, in my field, some there is already uh, some difficulty in, in, in expressing a viewpoint, I think that that is probably 10 times higher in, in the field that you're asking about. Uh, Tom, and then, yeah, I've seen... Three, three more. You just have a show of hands all round, actually, quickly. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, yeah, let's go on first. Hi, Alex. Uh, great talk. I uh, was at London Business School from uh, the Exec MBA. And thank you very much for making sure your book's on audio. Uh, obviously, greatly appreciated by some of us. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, in the political context, about how we rebut, how you talk about a fact or uh, opinion that's perhaps incorrect. Should we restate it as such? Should we... Uh, ignore it and talk about the other things. Let's, let's take a, something on the side of a bus, for example. Um, it's hard to talk about a, a, a the opposition standpoint without mentioning it and repeating it. We're often taught that we want to do a rebuttal uh, without using uh, the, the numbers they're using or, or talking about. It. What's, what's the best way of uh, rebutting those uh, things that may be misinterpreted and how do we de-escalate that belief system and de-escalate that ideological standpoint that they want it to be true? Thank you. So I hadn't heard of the idea that you don't repeat what people say, but I can see why people suggest that, because if you repeat it, then that, that will spread that number. Um, but for me, I, I think that it would spread anyway. I would want to tackle the head on the claim. So when I take on some of these McKinsey-type studies... I will try to say what they said, repeat what they said, and, and say why it's inaccurate. So I try to tackle it head on. And then in order to try to make sure that that cuts through, I might still say that the general premise of what they're trying to do is, is, is benign, just to show that it's I'm not ideologically opposed. So again, when I go back to diversity, I'll say, this does not invalidate diversity initiatives. It means that we should just consider more than a person's gender and ethnicity. The idea that cognitive diversity is the same as demographic diversity suggests that there is a female way of, way of thinking, there's an Asian way of thinking, there's a black way of thinking, and that is actually racist and, and sexist. We want to look beyond just the, these, these simple labels. So this suggests that I am not ideologically opposed to it. Otherwise, people will think, well, am I just trying to rebut it because of my own entrenched views? No, maybe I actually have a similar goal as the people I'm trying to rebut, but the method of trying to get there is one which is going to be more nuanced and based on evidence rather than trying to interpret everything as supporting my viewpoint. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really interested by your book and uh, uh, really looking forward to reading it. And thank you for your talk. Um, you talked right at the end. You said that uh, that society could teach more critical thinking in schools. And as someone who comes from from education, I can tell you that um, unfortunately you're you're right up against it there mm-hmm. because uh, when people in schools talk about uh, questioning uh, or teaching critical thinking, what they really mean is uh, you know not taking Trump at what he's uh, at face value. They will never uh, address the, the the other side, you know, other side, and taking a, a, a 
being more critical towards a left wing uh, bias, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the entire educational system is is designed in the exact opposite of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that exams are are set up, it's all about reproducing what you're supposed to reproduce. I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. Critical thinking would be an incredibly useful uh, um, tool um, and an incredibly useful thing for people to learn. But I, I don't know how you approach that. So I, I'm perhaps uh, skewed by my own biases here. So uh, and, and that's why I might have to raise your view. So I went to Montessori um, primary school. And so that was a different method of education, which encouraged you to ask questions and it encouraged you not just to learn by algorithm. So the headmistress, uh, she was from a classics background and she said, well, the word education comes from educo. You lead out of the student and get them to, to try to find the answer themselves rather than intrusion, which is how we often teach, which is intrudo, I thrust in. So I will tell you what the answer is and, 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 and you will just accept that. So I was lucky with that educational system. I think that has been something which has just continued with me. And that might be naturally why I'm drawn um, to topics like that. But in a world in which people are obsessed with measuring the outcomes of education and you have standardized test scores and this then encourages rote learning, that's problematic. And I actually tackle that in chapter, um, in, in chapter eight of the book. So I think it can be done, but I also agree with you that given some of the focus on, on measurement and also can you, what, what are you allowed to teach at school? If you're allowed to teach that there's lots of right answers and it's not inclusive to allow somebody to claim that we use different pronouns or whatever, then that that's something where uh, only one side might be able to get, get to, it's seen as an advance in edu education. Uh, oh, Alexi first, yeah. Yeah, so thank you for your talk. Found that very interesting. Um, I wanted to just come back to where you talked about the peer review process, which I thought was quite interesting. I remember Peter Bogosian and a colleague of his, I can't remember who the colleague was, but I'll just say Bogosian. He went out of his way to try and expose how ludicrous the uh, peer review process is. And he published a paper that said um, something along the lines that uh, gender is a social construct, but penises cause climate change. And it made it through the peer process, the peer review process. And when he and his colleague came out and basically said, you know, this was a hoax, we did this to expose how ridiculous academia could be, the response was furious. And they tried to cancel him. And this is where he, you know, started his sort of journey along the lines of realizing that academic freedom is not what it is. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of two pronged question I would ask. Um, how do you think the peer review process could be improved? And who peer reviewed your book before you sent it to the publisher? Thank you. So I, um, I, I have seen studies like this and I've seen other articles about how the system is broken and they really concern me. So, so for example, in um, citations, you have to cite um, a, a, a representative sample by ethnic minority or by gender of people. And I think this is crazy, right? You cite evidence based on its quality this is this is science and that's what that's the only thing that should be affecting citations so i have seen this in other fields fortunately it hasn't yet come to, to my field and because economics is a bit more boring than some of these topics like penises and climate change there is not such strong ideology there which has to date led to trying to find particular results so on the topics of sustainability there are as many papers finding that sustainability might not improve financial performance as the opposite but what i have read and these have been serious articles about the problems that that really does concern me in those other fields so what then might be the solution to this well i think one would be what is the success criteria for a journal and i think it should be scientific advancement and scientific inquiry so one thing is indeed the um so the impact factor of papers is not the only thing, but at least that is linked to science. But right now on any Elsevier website, so Elsevier is one of the major journal publishers, although the metric they'll have is the percentage of the editorial board, which is male or female. And so why is that the measure of success of a journal? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm very pro-diversity. When I was running the Rio Finance, I appointed the first female editors onto the editorial team in the 21-year history. But this was not because they were women. They, they were good, and they were women. 
Uh, but this is now the criterion uh, 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 against which um, journals are evaluated. And I, I think that should not be the case and we should not have metrics on the number of citations but by gender. This this is just ludicrous. Um, then in terms of who peer-reviewed my book, so for my first book, it was published by a university press and so they have peer reviewers. This one, I, I'm delighted to have Penguin Random House because they're much more mainstream, but it means that it doesn't have peer reviewers. So I found my own. So I found people who I knew uh, are critical and I, I, because I'd worked with them previously and I knew that they would highlight um, problems in the book. And out of the, all the agents that I worked with, about eight or nine agents offered me representation and I chose the one who was most critical about my initial proposal because I thought, well, then he's got the potential to improve it. And so even if there was no automatic peer review, I need to try to apply the findings of my book myself, encouraging dissent and so finding people I trust to, to criticise what I write. Mm. I, I think the lady just in front of Alexi had a question as well. And Tim? Yeah. We've talked a bit, to uh, Alex, about the uh, how statistics and data and AI can impact us. And thinking more specifically about technology and areas like insurance, uh, there is a fair amount of data which is used, which has been collected over the last uh, few decades, which influences the financial outcomes that you and I face be it the quote we get on our home insurance, be it the perception of some health outcomes or the treatments we are offered, or whether or not we'll even get a credit card. So in those contexts, given what you've said, how can some of the learnings and the insights you've gained be applied so that we have more fairer outcomes for the general population? So I think in, in many cases, data can be useful because it can correct biases. So I believe that with um, car insurance, you can choose if you wanted to have some tracker which looks at how, how your driving is. And I think based on that, uh, people have found that women are safer drivers than men and therefore women get lower premiums, which is good because like some of the original biases, certainly when I was growing up, were, were that men were better drivers. And so that would lead to just a misallocation and a misprice of insurance. So if indeed data is able to measure things better, then that can address some of those biases. But just like with AI, we also need to understand the limitations of data. So in, in my field, you are um, evaluated according to your citations. And so that, again, is useful for debiasing. I was in the nominating committee to nominate um, one of the recent presidents of our association, who's a female, who previously people had not had uh, had fully appreciated all of the great work she'd done. But when the citations were there, they thought, OK, maybe I was biased and this is just an impressive body of work. But sometimes citations can look at the quantity of citations rather than the quality. It may be that you've got lots and lots of scattergun papers, but none is, is, is truly a home run. Maybe people are citing it, um, even though it's an incremental work, they're citing it in a long list of other papers rather than having it as the central thing that they're building on. And so just understand what the data captures and that can debias things. But it can also, um, if we're too stuck on the data and we don't realise what it misses out, then that can be a concern. Um, Alex, I want to say, first of all, how much I enjoyed your talk. Uh, my mind started whirring uh, within seconds of your answering um, some of Tom's questions. Um, I am known in my office as being a bit of a contrarian. Uh, and whenever someone comes up with an argument for doing it, I try and come up with the opposite argument. Lies, lies, damn lies and statistics is also something, a phrase I've used for many, many years. Now, so what was my question? I was just thinking, what were the people who had influenced me quite a lot in my life? Um, and uh, probably Adam Smith uh, is right up there and, and maybe Karl Marx. Uh, and I wondered if anyone, if you have, have uh, encouraged anyone to look at their works and thoughts in the context of how were they influenced by biases. Mm. And if not, it's a project. Yeah, <laughs> my, my simple answer is... Uh, uh, Book number three. <laughs> I have not, I'm, I'm afraid. So like, and I've actually not read their work directly. So I obviously know of their work and I've read paraphrases of, of their work, which are hopefully accurate paraphrases. But I've never gone back to, to the original source. And I think just everybody is prone to them. Like, I am a product of my own upbringing, which is, might be why I have a more rosy view of 
critical thinking in schools and others, and this will be the same for them. So they will have been influenced by their biases, which is why maybe to get to a closer view of the truth, we need to read both Smith and Marx rather than only one or the other. So we're just about out of time, but um, two quick questions, uh, both at the back. It can be very difficult to measure economic statistics. This country has a huge problem of calculation in the size of the labour force through multiple ONS, HMRC and other data becoming becoming harder to interpret. But it's self-evident that Britain has, has a problem of problem post-COVID of people dropping out of the labour force. In most other European countries, people have not dropped from the labour force. It's either labour force is either increased as expected or remain the same. And and because of the because of the labour force drop because of people not working, choose not to work, our country our labour our country has clearly in fact, clearly has supply and demand issues in the labour market, and this is obviously leading to inflation. Why? How? What this shows how difficult it is to make economic. It is to deliver economic statistic, and also, and also, why did it? And also, how? How could the BOE have realised 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 throughout the benefits of hindsight that Britain's labour. The Britain's labour market would decrease. Would it? Would 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 decrease? That people that so many that so many people draw out of the labour market post mm. pandemic. I will have in so the, the quality of statistics and yeah. everything. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I might have to repeat the answer I gave the House of Commons, which I, I don't know. So, so, so I'm not a labour economist. So, so I, I'm an ex, I, I have expertise in, in various fields, but not so much labour e economics. So I know that there has been a withdrawal of the, of the labour force in, in the UK compared to other countries. But but why and why the Bank of England didn't fully appreciate that? I, I'm afraid I, I can't really answer this because I, I can't speak for the Bank of England. I was not in, in, in those deliberations. But I fully agree with you that it's a concern and it needs to be addressed. But how to do that, that would take people who, who understand the data on that field more better than me. And I mean, in, in your own work, do you encounter a similar problem where the data is just incomplete or not there or you're sceptical of its accuracy? Or it's timeliness. Yes, in particular in sustainability. So yeah. because sustainability is something which is quite nebulous. And, and many people like my work is on the benefits of sustainability. But if you've got so much freedom to pick your data, you'll pick the data source which is most correlated with financial performance in order to show something that you do want to show. So understanding, well, what does the data show and what the, what the data does not show is important. So if indeed there's different classifications across countries as to what counts as economically inactive... And if the UK says, oh, we've got such a low unemployment rate because the denominator has shrunk because we're counting certain people as economically inactive rather than part of the labour force, then we need to understand that because that's what that could be why you have a artificially high, mm -hmm. uh, artificially low, sorry, um, unemployment rate. All right. Final question. You've held the microphone all evening, so go for it. <laughs> um, I've got a question for you. If data can be deceiving, um, do you think econometrics as a whole subject is flawed? So I think econometrics is trying to use data better. And so the econometric tools are trying to use things like instrumental variables, as you mentioned, and natural experiments to get from correlation to, to causation. Uh, but I think sometimes people can be too obsessed with the very best econometrics and letting perfect get in the enemy, uh, get being the enemy of, of the good. I'm not an amazing econometrician. So out of the spectrum of academics, I'm not particularly technical. What I love more is the dissemination of ideas to the general public. So I have an example of some of my own studies where I just use common sense in order to get to a particular conclusion. And then I said, because I haven't used fancy econometrics, you can't put 100% weight on my conclusion. Maybe it's 90, maybe it's 80%. But I still think that the study is useful. It moves our priors from maybe 50 to 80, even if I can't go all the way. Yeah. I, I don't want to keep Alex from his undeniably life extending red wine. Uh, but I think, I, did I just see another hand shoot up? Yeah, if people have come here to yeah. ask questions, I don't well, we'll have to take them. I think the question was kind of answered, but I was going to get you to expand on the intuition and education leading you up the garden path a little bit. You know, studies and all these sort of academic papers that, you know, the gentleman was saying about climate change and all sorts. You know, like, how do you. How do you, you were mentioning, you know, the reliability of your statements based on how much intuition you use compared to how much uh, data you you collected on the issue? Uh, 
you know, could you expand a bit more on that? I mean, you kind of answered the question a little bit before, but um, when you answer, because being, being a po in politics or um, interested in politics, anyone here is interested in politics, you have to be a jack of all trades. And this is a cognitive dissonant environment where you yeah. have to demonstrate intelligence to understand that you're going to think one thing, understand another, and come to a sort of in-between conclusion somewhat in, in all your understandings. So there's going to be a lot of sort of dissonance going on. And I, I think in the balance has obviously got to be struck. So that's my, my general question. I mean, I think we, we do see it in politics, at least it's talked about a lot, um, but the most important thing for a politician is to have good instincts, mm -hmm. um, whereas often people can get bogged down in the data and, and become unable to make decisions. I won't name any names, but I think we can mm -hmm. we can all imagine them. Um, so that is there basically an inherent tension between politics and policy making and the kind of um, rational thinking that you, you're, you're advocating in this book? I think there is not a tension if you understand the limitations of data. So just like in, in, in the spirit of some of my other answers, data is really useful and, and peer-reviewed top studies are useful, but they are not the end be all end all. Like we don't treat illnesses by you sitting as a patient and Googling the best research, you will see a doctor. Why? Because research finds what works in general for all of the people who went into that study, but maybe you've got unique circumstances, and which, which means that you might have a, a different potential remedy to this. And this is the same with, with data in general. So, so nobody really chooses to play football rather than rugby because of data showing that football has a better effect on your health or a better effect on income because you meet more friends at football. You might have other criteria. Maybe it could be that uh, if the football pitch is closer to where you are or maybe because your friends do this. So the end of the book highlights that even though we want to be careful with data when we use this, we also recognise that data doesn't answer everything. So data can show you how to achieve one particular outcome. But as per our, our, our earlier discussion, maybe there's, there's alternative outcomes there. Maybe the data is an average result that doesn't take into account your specific situation. Maybe um, data shows that football players earn more money than finance professors. But to say, oh, I should have become a footballer instead of a finance professor would have not been a, a good answer because that doesn't take into account my unique situation, which is that my passion for football is much better than my actual ability. So, yeah, like, even if we have general statistics, they might not apply to your particular circumstance. And so we want to make sure we're informed by the data, but not enslaved by it. Brilliant. Alex, thank you so much for tonight, for coming and talking about your book. As I said, it's a it's a really good read and I recommend it. It's available at the back. Um, you know, please join me in giving Alex a round of applause and then join me across the hall for drinks afterwards. Thank you so much.